somebody was just screaming, get under your desk. I was terrified, I thought we were all gonna die. I've never been so scared. It shook and swayed and I just dove under my desk and, and I, you know, nobody really knew what to do. That was the scary part. We all kind of looked at each other and then immediately ran out the door. <laughs> On February 28, 2001, most people were enjoying themselves as spring offered its first warm days since winter. But this day would provide one more surprise many people were not prepared for. An earthquake struck the Pacific Northwest at 10.45 a.m. It had a magnitude of 6.8 on the Richter scale and was centered 35.7 miles south-southwest of Seattle, Washington. Considering the magnitude of the quake, there were a relatively small number of injuries. The demands placed on the emergency and post shelter and recovery systems were minimal when compared to other quakes of similar magnitude, including the San Francisco earthquake of 1989. What made this earthquake different from the one in San Francisco was its depth, 33 miles underground. Had this been a shallow quake of the same magnitude, the damage to life and property would have been much more severe. I was just outside the building actually, walking from the street to the building, and I noticed to my surprise that there was a car right next to me that was shaking violently back and forth. I was in downtown Seattle in the Bank of America Tower, 37 floors up. As soon as that started shaking, we all kind of looked at each other and then immediately ran out the door. <laughs> and I was just like covered with needles and, and like had to open the door and stand in the doorway, and one of the doctors came and hugged me because I was terrified. I thought we were all going to die. I was on the 16th floor. It's an all glass building and I've never been so scared. It shook and swayed and I just dove under my desk and, and I, you know, nobody really knew what to do. That was the scary part is that everybody seemed kind of unprepared, kind of unprepared. Geologists study seismic events in an attempt to explain how and why the earth moves when it does. The shaking that startles the rest of us provides data for scientists to analyze. We spoke with Anthony Kumar from the State of Washington Seismology Center to find out more about the geology of our region and why the Nisqually quake wasn't as devastating as it could have been. In different parts of the world, there are different plates that are moving relative to one another. Sometimes the plates move past each other horizontally. And a good example of that is down in California where the San Andreas Fault marks the boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North America Plate. Here in the Pacific Northwest, and that includes Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and Southern British Columbia, we have a different situation. We have two plates converging toward one another. And one plate, as it uh, bumps up against North America, uh, we call that plate the Juan de Fuca Plate, actually dives beneath uh, North America and reaches depths of uh, 100 kilometers, so that's about 60 miles or more, before the earthquakes within that plate kind of peter out. So we have, uh, unlike California, we have deep earthquakes extending from the surface all the way down to about uh, 60 miles below the surface. Uh, we, we have to keep in mind that this is one type of earthquake that we have in the Pacific Northwest, one of three types. We also have very shallow earthquakes, like earthquakes that occur on the Seattle Fault which could be more damaging because they occur closer to the surface. And then there's the infamous uh, subduction zone earthquake just offshore, which can reach magnitude 9, considerably larger than the earthquake uh, that we just had in February. At the time of an earthquake, much of what happens is uh, automated. Uh, we have so many seismograph stations, uh, a person cannot possibly monitor all these stations simultaneously. So we have a computer that monitors all these stations. So at the time of this earthquake, uh, some of the stations began recording the waves that arrived from the epicenter of the earthquake to the nearest stations. And then 
successively, uh, seconds later, the waves would arrive at the next station and so forth until the most distant stations in our network would have received all the data. And the, the computer, in the meantime, is processing all these data and determines the, a preliminary location and a size of the earthquake, the magnitude of the earthquake. Uh, at the same time, uh, the computer will actually send out uh, alert messages on paging systems uh, via email and so forth. So, uh, for example, I was outside the building, my pager went off within a few seconds after the earthquake. The Alaska Way Viaduct is one of Seattle's major thoroughfares. Built in the 1950s, the viaduct was not built to current seismic standards. As a result, major structural damage developed in the days that followed the quake. To tell us more about the damage and the repairs needed, we asked Claudia Cornish from the Washington State Department of Transportation to explain the issues. One of the major pieces of damage we had in downtown Seattle was on a pier on the Alaskan Way Viaduct, which is where we're standing right now. Uh, it's a structure that was built in the mid-50s and it was not built to current earthquake codes. So we knew it was a seismically vulnerable structure to begin with, and of course it was a priority concern for us right after the earthquake. Uh, we did find damage to Pier 97, we call it, which is right at Washington Street, downtown Seattle. What happened was we have some joints that called knee joints that connect the vertical and horizontal um, supporting structure of the pier. The knee joint broke in the earthquake and that was a, of significant concern to us so we immediately began a repair to get that in place. We started monitoring the pier and found after a few weeks that a crack in the pier actually had widened and that was of enough concern to our engineers that we closed the structure down and put up some emergency temporary shoring. That shoring is what's in place right now and then we began to expand the scope of the design to repair the pier. When you get to a structure like the viaduct, it was built in the mid-50s and it was not built to current codes. So we don't really know how this structure will fare in another major earthquake. There are a lot of variables in earthquakes and it would depend on where the epicenter was, which way the, the ground moved, and we can't predict that. So. We have an accelerated study going on right now within the department to look at that very question concerning the viaduct. Do we put the money into the viaduct to retrofit it to current earthquake standards, or do we look at an, another alternative altogether? And our department is heading up that study, and we hope to have a recommendation to the legislature by early 2002. In the meantime, we're doing everything we can to ensure that the viaduct is safe and operational and we'll just hope that there's not another earthquake. Some may ask, how prepared is the Seattle area in case of another earthquake? Earthquakes can make entire buildings collapse. That's what brings us here to the Seattle Fire Department's Urban Search and Rescue Training Center. My name is Lieutenant Matt Rogers. I work on the uh, Seattle Fire Department Technical Rescue Team, and I'm also a member of the uh, Puget Sound Urban Search and Rescue Team, which is a multi-jurisdictional uh, search and rescue team, the same teams that were involved in Oklahoma City and other disasters around the United States. Urban Search and Rescue locally, they focus on a bunch of different disciplines, um, rope rescue, uh, confined space rescue, trench rescue, structural collapse, uh, things along those lines. Heavy uh, rescue, which is more or less crane rescue, rigging, stuff like that. We carry uh, several hundred thousand dollars of equipment that's uh, put together in a cache and we have the ability to palletize that equipment and put it back on a, a C-141, a military plane, and transport it anywhere in the country. Uh, we, we carry heavy rigging equipment, we carry uh, search cameras, which are fiber optic cameras that we're allowed to drill into concrete and look into spaces that we normally can't look into and see if there's victims inside. We carry breaching equipment, basically, uh, uh, equipment to blast through concrete. And for example, we carry torches. Uh, that's an exothermic torch. It burns at 6,000 degrees and we can cut through metal pretty quickly. 
We also carry a lot of different equipment to lift heavy objects. Each responsible engine and truck company has to go around their neighborhood and survey their district. And they're looking for buildings that are heavily damaged or moderately damaged. And what we do is we transfer that information to our alarm center and also we have a resource management center so they know what buildings are, are structurally damaged and then we get engineers out there to look at them. And what they do is they tag them red, yellow, or green. Red meaning absolutely no entry at all. It's severely dangerous uh, or, or damaged and uh, very dangerous for entry down to a green, which would mean it's okay for in limited entry. So they did that uh, quite rapidly in the Seattle quake, which really helped our operation. Well, during that day, we had a lot of fires uh, start up because of electrical shorts and also natural gas lines were breached. Uh, we had a warehouse fire down there where a lot of people that were there were people that were off shift that uh, staffed uh, additional apparatus that we carry in the city for such events. So it, was, uh, it really worked out well. We had people that are normally assigned to administrative positions or training positions that gathered up enough equipment to staff these apparatus and, and then run around the city and mitigate a lot of incidents. A good escape plan, understanding where you can shut off your power and your gas and having plenty of uh, a rationing available so you can sustain yourself for at least 72 hours is probably the key to keeping yourself uh, uh, okay and insulated from an incident like that. We're very prepared. Uh, we do have the urban search and rescue cache of equipment here, and we have uh, approximately 200 people trained in urban search and rescue. All the local fire departments in the, in the uh, Puget Sound area are very well trained in search and rescue and a lot of the technical disciplines we've talked about. Uh, we have uh, uh, lots of, of caches of equipment. The hospital system is fantastic, where we have the uh, administrative network where we can determine uh, what patients are going to what hospital, uh, how much room that they have. Uh, the EMS system ties in real well with the search and rescue system, so we, once we do extricate people, we know where to send them to get them the treatment the fastest. So the whole thing, I think that we've done a fantastic job here, and then also a lot of these structural retrofits that we've done lately have sure paid off, and you've noticed that. The areas that were hit the largest were the areas that didn't have a lot of reinforcement, and a lot of the older buildings that were reinforced uh, did very well. One can only imagine the challenges that lie ahead. But with professionals like the ones we've met here today, the chance for a better tomorrow shines brighter than ever. I'm Michael Fernahoff. Thanks for watching. I'm a seismologist here at the University of Washington. You can find more information at www.mbfproductions.com.